All right, let's take a look at some infections and some benign tumors. So let's look at candidiasis, right? This is a form of vaginitis that is not sexually transmitted, and it's caused by the fungus Candida albicans, right? That should sound a little bit familiar. I'm pretty sure we talked about Candida candida of the mouth, right, resulting in thrush of the tongue due to uh, overuse of antibiotics and the oral contraceptive, remember that? So now we're seeing this fungal infection again. So this is caused by candida albicans. It's an opportunistic infection by the normal flora of the vaginal area. And again, this is caused by antibiotic therapy. We could see it in pregnancy. We could see it in diabetes and in individuals who have a weakened uh, immune system or reduced host resistance, such as HIV. With candidiasis, it causes red and swollen, intensive pruritic mucous membranes, and a thick white curd-like discharge. That's seen with candida overgrowth and it may extend to the vulvar tissues. The best treatment for this is antifungals. Uh, there are many drugs that are referred to as the azoles. Oh, monostat is uh, also a big popular one, monostat. Uh, PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. This is an infection of the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and or the ovaries, right? So now we're talking about the entire reproductive tract, right? With the exception of the vaginal canal. We're talking about the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and or the ovaries. Now this could be acute or chronic. This infection is an ascending infection, right? It's an infection usually originates as an ascending infection from the lower reproductive tract. And the majority of the infections arise from STDs. All right, so PID is usually a result of a sexually transmitted disease such as gonorrhea or chlamydia, and we'll talk about these in a later lecture. Um, we'll also see this in non-sterile abortions or childbirth. It can be a cause of bacteremia and peritonitis, right? Peritonitis uh, in a case where, let's say, uh, an appendix ruptured and there's peritonitis, or a diverticuli or diverticulitis ruptured, creating uh, an infection into the peritoneum. So here is pelvic inflammatory disease, PID, and we're just seeing different portions along the reproductive tract that's being affected. Okay, so it's ascending. We can see that it's moving here, up in this direction, from a vaginitis to a, into the cervix, cervicitis. And now we're moving up here. Now it's affecting the endometrium, endometriitis. And now it's moving into the fallopian tubes or the uterine tubes. And now we have a salpingitis, and now it can also um, spread into the ovaries where it's an oophoritis or oophoritis. Okay, but either way, it's ascending up. With PID, uh, the problem here is that there could be scarring of the tubes, which increase the risk of infertility and ectopic pregnancies. An ectopic pregnancy is when there's um, basically implantation someplace other than the uterus, okay? Um, with pelvic inflammatory disease or PID, the pelvic pain is usually the very first sign. It's usually sudden, it's severe, and there's increasing intensity. Worse with walking. There can be purulent discharge at the opening of the cervical neck, it's called a cervical os. That's the opening of the uterus where the cervix is. Os is, is the mouth. There's dysuria, fever, and leukocytosis. These are 
uh, the biggies, right? First sign uh, with PID is usually pelvic pain. That's usually the first. Then there's painful urination, fever, and increased white blood cells, leukocytes. And the treatment is going to be uh, antibiotic therapy for PID. Now let's look at a le um, a leomyoma, a leomyoma, leomyoma, also referred to as fibroids. Now this is a benign tumor of the myometrium, right? We did the endometrium. Now let's look at the myometrium. That's a leomyoma. Um, it's common, pretty common during the reproductive years, and that's because they are hormone dependent. It can really increase in size and decrease in size based on what estrogen is doing or what progesterone is doing. And these fibroids are typically classified by location. They could be within the uterine wall, they could be underneath or beneath the endometrium, or they could be beneath the serosa. And if you look at their names, it kind of indicates their, loco their location, right? Intramural, right? Within the uterine wall. Submucosal, that's beneath the endometrium. Subserosal, that's beneath the serosa. Um, there's usually multiple fibroids. They're pretty well defined, and they're unencapsulated masses. These leomyomas, they're, they're hormone dependent. They're pretty large during pregnancy, again, based on what the hormones are doing. And during menopause, they can become fibrotic and they shrink. They become much, much smaller. Um, often they're asymptomatic. When they're small, they're pretty asymptomatic. And then as they become larger, they become more uncomfortable. Uh, menorrhagia um, is pressure on the adjacent structures, so they could be urinary frequency, there could be constipation, and just this feeling of fullness in the lower abdomen. And it can also interfere with implantation. The treatment for fibroids are typically hormonal therapy or surgery. These are the different locations of these fibroids. So if we take a look here, here is the submucosal. If we look here, here is a uh, endometrial polyp, right? This is the endometrium. If we look here, this one is subserosal. Okay. So they could be at, at different locations, and the names typically give it away, right? Here is submucosal, subserosal, and then we have a endometrial polyp. And here you can see this one is, uh, is hollowed out in the center. They're not all um, uh, filled or solid through. This one we cut through, and they're, uh, you know, empty in the center, pretty much. Now, ovarian cysts, the, the, there are a variety of types that occur, um, and these are fluid-filled sacs right here. No fluid, but with the ovarian cysts, uh, they are fluid-filled sacs, and they frequently occur on the ovary. Usually there's multiple, they're small, and they're fluid-filled sacs. They typically last somewhere between 8 to 12 weeks, and then they disappear without any complications. Um, if bleeding occurs, the more serious inflammation occurs, and that can require uh, surgical intervention. Ultrasound or laparoscopy, these are the techniques that are used to identify these ovarian cysts. Now PCOS, PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, these have, this is the fibrous capsule, thickens around the follicles of the ovary. Now this can be hereditary. There is the absence of ovulation and infertility. This too is related to hormonal imbalances, possibly between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Right? We think of all the hormones between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, uh, especially the anterior pituitary, where there's um, luteinizing hormone and there's uh, follicular stimulating hormone 
and there's um, what else is there? Uh, luteinizing hormone pro. Uh, what's the other one? I'm kind of I'm drawing a blank here. There's uh, from the posterior. There's oxytocin and ADH. And from the anterior, it's luteinizing hormone. There's growth hormone. There's melanocyte stimulating hormone. There's and uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and there is oh uh, prolactin also. I forgot about that prolactin for lactation. Okay, so uh, this could be related to hormonal imbalances, not just between the hypothalamus and pituitary. We also see PCOS sometimes in for different forms of obesity. We see it with prediabetes, um, also with insulin imbalances. So one of the things that we commonly check for when we see signs of polycystic ovarian syndrome is what is the blood sugar like and what's insulin levels like? Usually glucose levels are a little bit higher and the hemoglobin A1C levels could be a little bit higher. Uh, the a, the uh, manifestations of PCOS, amenorrhea, now it's no menstrual cycle, hirsutism, uh, hirsutu, hirsutism. The hirsutism is when there's um, uh, growth of hair, right, in unwanted places, hair on the chin, hair on the chest, that's hirsutism. And then we have infertility. Um, so the treatment for PCOS, these are medications to try and stimulate ovulation or oral contraceptives to try and reduce the masculinization. Okay, so the hair on the chin and the hair on the chest and, and the hair along the sideburns, right? Um, sometimes this could make many women feel a little bit uncomfortable. So those could be an early indication of polycystic ovarian syndrome. All right, FBD, fibrocystic breast disease. So this includes a pretty broad range of breast changes and increased density of the breast tissue. There are cyclic occurrence of nodules or masses in the breast tissue, and that's based on these hormonal ups and downs, right? The spikes and dips of the hormones. There is uh, non-proliferative lesions. These are not precancerous. These consist of microcysts and fibroadenomas. Then there is proliferative lesions. These are not atypical cells that are present. There's no atypical cells. The risk of breast cancer increases with a family of history of breast cancer. Uh, the proliferative uh, lesions with atypical cells, This, these are going to require monitoring, okay, routine monitoring for this. These uh, cysts are typically firm, they're movable cysts or nodules, and they can vary in size. And the manifestations, they are more noticeable or marked before menstruation when the breasts are heavier, they're painful, and tender. Okay, and again, responsive to these hormonal changes uh, during uh, menses or during just any changes that can cause uh, even pregnancy, right? Changes within the density of the breast tissue. So manifestations, they're more marked before menses when the breasts are heavier, painful and tender, and that's due to the, uh, the shifts in hormones. Okay, so treatment-wise, it's, it's symptomatic treatment. Um, there is benefit if you drink lots of coffee that's caffeinated, reduce the caffeine, reduce the fat intake. Uh, the cyst can also be drained. And menopause tends to ease a lot of the symptoms and cause improvement. Again, due to the stabilization and balancing of the hormones. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about cervical cancer, uterine cancer, and ovarian cancer.